Hey everyone, it's Kenji. Uh, I'm making some meatballs with uh, mushroom cream sauce. Actually, there's not gonna be any cream in it, but it's a mushroom sauce. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do, um, th this is sort of loosely based on this meatball recipe from my book, um, The Food Lab, um, but I'm gonna make it a little bit different because I don't have all the ingredients in there. But the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start with about a quarter cup of milk. You could use buttermilk, you could use cream, you could also use chicken stock, something like that. Quarter cup of milk, and then here's the real trick, a little bit of gelatin. So we're gonna add about a quarter ounce of gelatin, which is, I don't know, a few teaspoons. And we're gonna let that sit on top of the milk, milk and hydrate. And what this gelatin does is that when you incorporate this stuff into your meatballs, um, as they cook, the meat kinda, e even, even the small little chopped up bits of meat are gonna contract and push out juices. Um, and what the gelatin does is it helps trap in those juices so your meatballs stay more tender and more juicy as you go. All right, so I got my milk. I'm gonna do, this is a mix of pork and beef. You can do all pork or all beef or all lamb or whatever meat you want. This is um, a pound of it. Um, and then to that, I'm gonna add a big, a big old pinch of salt. I'm gonna season also with some white pepper. Oops, spoon doesn't fit in there. A little bit of white pepper. A little bit of red pepper flakes. Cause I like a little heat. Um, and then, oh, you know what I need? Um, I need some nutmeg. Nutmeg, nutmeg, nutmeg. Cloves, nutmeg. There you go, nutmeg. Nutmeg is kind of the classic sort of Swedish meatball flavor. Nutmeg, you do want to go fresh grated generally. I mean, you, you can use, you can use pre-ground, it's fine, but fresh grated tastes better. Sorry, I don't want to do a, I don't want to be in a garden here and pretend that you got to do everything artisanal and hand, handmade. All right, so we got our meat. Um, we're going to add an egg. I just popped right out. We'll add them like that. <laughs> Ugh, ectoplasmic residue. All right. We got our egg there. And now, a little bit of soy sauce. Here, let me get, let me get this raw egg off my fingers. Um, so meat on its own tastes meaty. Um, but the thing that makes meat taste meaty, you know, the, the thing that gives us that umami sensation is, um, well, it's a couple different chemicals, but the main one is glutamic acid. Um, so, you know, monosodium glutamate is a source of glutamic acid. Um, it's also, you know, things like Parmesan cheese, mushrooms, those are all rich in glutamic acid. Um, so by adding things that are rich in glutamic acid to meat, you can make them taste a little bit meatier. So in this case, I'm doing a little bit of soy sauce, about a teaspoon of soy sauce to there. Um, I'm also going to add some Worcestershire sauce. So Worcestershire sauce has um, anchovies in it, um, which um, have glutamic acid, but they also add a thing called inosinic acid, which um, it doesn't taste very meaty on its own, but it enhances the the flavor of, um, it enhances the meat enhancing flavor of um, glutamic acid. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like if... Um, Glutamic acid is Batman, inosinic acid is Robin. It's like not, not too effective on its own, but it helps a lot um, in the overall scheme of things. All right, so our, our, our gelatin is mostly bloomed. So that milk mixture is gonna go in here, milk and gelatin. Um, if you don't wanna do soy sauce and, and uh, Worcestershire, there's other things that are rich in glutamic acid. You could use Marmite or Vegemite. Um, you could use anchovy fillets. Um, you could just use straight up MSG. There's nothing wrong with that either. Um, all right, so I'm gonna add, how much, how much bread goes in here? Oh, in my recipe it says two slices of sandwich bread. So I'm gonna, this is, these are breadcrumbs that I ground from dried up bread earlier. So I'll have, I don't know, not that much. Um, what bread does is it, um, you know, if you, if you don't add breadcrumbs, what, what can happen is that your sausage mixture, rather than, um, having, sorry, not your sausage mixture, your, your meat mixture, rather than having the texture of meatballs, which are kind of tender and soft, um, they can turn into sort of a, more of a sausage where they kind of get like snappy and dense, which is what you want for sausage, but not what you want for, for meatballs. You don't want your meatballs to be kind of springy and dense. You want them to be tender. Oh, you know what else I'm gonna get in there? Some garlic. 
And meanwhile, I'm going to get my pan heated up so I can start frying these guys. All right. So we're gonna get about about a quarter inch or so of oil in there. So this is somewhere, you know, somewhere between deep frying and pan frying, shallow frying. Um, and then I'm also gonna get this pan preheated. This is where I'm gonna make my mushroom sauce. So also a little bit of oil in there. Maybe a tablespoon of oil. Okay, so I got my garlic. My daughter requested meatballs today. You need some milk and cheese? I'll get you some, I'll get you some milk and cheese. All right, sorry about that. Uh, I'm sorry, my daughter wanted some milk and cheese. All right, so I've got, I'm gonna do three cloves of garlic here. I'm gonna... So this basic ma meatball technique, by the way, um, you know, it's the same basic technique you would use if you're, whether you're making these kinds of sort of like Swedish, Swedish-ish meatballs, or if you're making, you know, Italian-American meatballs, where instead of, um, instead of nutmeg, you would add Parmesan cheese, or maybe some, maybe some ground up or diced up pancetta, um, some parsley, you know, but the same basic process of incorporating uh, the dairy, you know, the eggs, the milk, the um, <clears throat> breadcrumbs, and the gelatin. Those are all things, those are things that I would do no matter what kind of meatball I was making, or if I was making meatloaf, um, any kind of sort of tender ground meat thing. Meatloaf, meatballs, hamburg steak, that kind of stuff. All right, and then let's also this is some thyme from the garden. Let's throw some thyme leaves in there. I'm not even gonna bother. I'm not even gonna bother chopping them. We'll just as long as there's no big stems in there, I think we're good. Okay, so now we're gonna mix this all up. Now the real trick to the trick to seeing if you've seasoned it properly, put a little bit of it in a bowl like this. Get your microwave. Call on your buddy, Chef Mike. And you cook for 10, 15 seconds just until it's cooked through. Um, and then you can taste it and you can see if it needs more salt. Um, that way you don't have to kind of eyeball it. Um, you could of course also measure this. Um, if, I was, if I was doing this by weight, I would go for about one and a half percent um, salt by weight to the meat. No, that does not need any more salt. That's good. All right. So now I'm gonna get a plate. I'm gonna get a little water in this bowl. And then using wet hands, damp hands is, I think Chef John says, is that a Chef John thing? We're gonna make balls. You can make them any size you want. I'm going kind of largish, largish balls because I find small, small balls to be a little fiddly. Is something funny? <laughs> Are you laughing because I'm talking about balls? <laughs> Small balls are fiddly. Yes, you can feel free to leave your comments below. We got our, our nice medium sized balls, not too big, not too small. <laughs> only, only moderately fiddly. Um, and I'm gonna fry them. This is cast iron. Um, you can, you know, cast iron works, non-stick works. Even stainless steel will work. Um, if you're doing stainless steel, you wanna just, you really do wanna make sure that it's nicely preheated before you get the balls in there. Um, otherwise, they'll stick to the bottom. Um, and then the real key is once you get these going, don't try and move them. 
Um, especially if you're in stainless steel, don't try and move them until that bottom is nicely browned. All right, so while those cook, I'm gonna make this mushroom cream sauce. Here's a quick wash. All right, so mushroom cream sauce. We're going to start with eight ounces of cremini mushrooms. So when, when you're chopped, when you have a lot of vegetables to chop, um, I always like to think of it as sort of like a I'm, a, I'm a factory assembly line where I do all of one task first and then all the other tasks. So I'm gonna start by cutting off all the bottoms first and then I'm gonna go ahead and start slicing them. Um, that way you, it's, mu it's much more efficient as far as your motion goes. You don't have to spend all the time um, in between each mushroom doing every single task. You just do it all at once. Okay, and then so to cut mushrooms, I cut off the ends like that. See, like a couple slices off the end, then turn it on its side. You see, so the idea is that you give it a a kind of stable base first and that makes it easy to um, go pretty fast on the next bit um, and we're aiming for you know relatively thin slices maybe between an eighth and a quarter of an inch but there's no need to be real super precise here um, even if they're a little bit uneven, it's still gonna work fine. All right, so I got my oil preheating over there. I get my mushrooms in. And then I'm gonna get some butter here. Check out those, uh, look at those meatballs are doing. There you go. Nice and brown. That's what we're looking for. I'm gonna reduce the heat a little bit just so that we make sure that they're not gonna over brown before the sauce is ready to accept them. So these, we're mainly gonna brown them on the exterior here, and then we're gonna finish. You don't have to worry too much about them cooking all the way through while they're in this, uh, you know, in the browning phase, because they're gonna finish it by simmering in the sauce. So mushrooms, they are, they have a lot of liquid in them. Um, by the way, you can, if your mushrooms are dirty, you can wash them. Um, these, one, these ones I had uh, rinsed before. You can wash them, no problem. Just wash them, spin them in the salad, spin them in the salad spinner. Um, or don't even bother, they're gonna cook just fine. Um, either way, you know, they're gonna start by expressing quite a bit of moisture. Um, and you're gonna see, this will probably eventually start to kind of steam a little bit um, and boil rather than sear. And that's fine, because once that moisture all um, sizzles away, they're gonna start browning again. Um, so, yeah, mushrooms are, mushrooms are pretty forgiving to cook. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to overcook them until they really get burnt. Um, all right, so the other thing I'm gonna do is and that sauce is an onion. This one I'm gonna mince up real fine. Um, incidentally, I know sometimes people say that that horizontal cut makes no difference. Um, it does. And I, I think I, m I mentioned in another video that I, I with a friend of mine, I, we built a mathematical model of an onion and sort of calculated um, the effectiveness of various cuts on the onion. And we found that um, indeed the horizontal cut does make a difference as far as um, evenness of um, onion pieces go. Um, because it, without that horizontal cut, what ends up happening is that the pieces towards the end, um, as, you're, as you're cutting here, you know, you're, you're, you're slicing it this way. So in the middle, 
everything you're cutting basically perpendicular to the layers um, and so you end up breaking into small pieces but when you get towards the end you're cutting almost parallel with the layers and so the the side pieces um, get quite thick um, so, so even when you cut them off they end up being kind of slivers instead of dice so that horizontal cut um, knocks those side pieces down so to, to make sure that they are all um, within a th certain threshold as far as the size goes. Garlic and onions. This feels like, this is like that time of year when garlic skins are really stuck on, you know? The garlic goes through phases because it gets it gets harvested and then it ages um, in storage. Well, I guess it depends where you get your where you get your garlic from, whether it's lo local or imported. Um, but it gets held in storage, and the longer it gets held in storage, the easier it becomes for that the skins to slip off. So very fresh garlic, um, which is coming in this time of year, uh, I find to be harder to peel, a little bit more fiddly to peel. So we got some nice browning going on. Actually, I'm gonna go with white pepper on this one. A little white pepper, a little salt. Okay. And I'm gonna go in with a little bit of butter couple tablespoons of butter. This is going to be basic sort of bechamel, you know, like a white sauce, so butter, flour, um, and then I'm going to do a combination of chicken stock and, uh, what is that there, a little garlic skin, chicken stock and milk. Um, again, you could do heavy cream if you want, you could do, you can do buttermilk, buttermilk is delicious, creme fraiche would be delicious too. And I got my butter in there, and I'm going to go into my garlic and onions. And those garlic and onions, we just really want them to sweat out. We don't want to add much color to them. I don't want that sweetness. These aren't sweet meatballs, they're just Swedish meatballs. Um, and thyme. I'm gonna just throw the whole thyme sprigs in just like that. So they'll add flavor and then at the end it'll be really easy to pull the kind of twigs out. Either you can do it manually or you can let your, you know, I'll let my I'll let my wife and daughter do it themselves at the table. Let's try and get one more side of these browned. Browning is flavor, of course. Um, there you go. That looks good. Okay, so this is looking pretty good now. I'm gonna add my flour in there. So it was, that was a couple tablespoons of butter, so I'm also gonna add a couple tablespoons of flour. I just eyeball it. And what we're doing is we're making a roux here. So the oil, butter, and flour are gonna combine together. And what's gonna happen is that, so what happens is if, if you take flour and you try and add it directly to a water-based liquid, you know, say chicken stock, milk, anything like that, and you add it directly there, um, the flour, what happens is it forms these like kind of little capsules where the exterior of the capsule is gelatinized flour, gelatinized starch, while the inside is still dry flour. Um, and so it becomes really difficult to incorporate flour evenly into a liquid. Um, not only that, but, but Flour incorporated straight into a liquid has a raw flavor to it. Um, so the point of a roux is when you cook flour in a fat, what it does is the fat coats each individual little particle of flour so that then when you add your liquid, it, um, the particles are already separated from each other. So when the starch starts to, starts to, to swell up and set, it doesn't form um, clumps, um, at, least, at least not if you're careful about it, which we're gonna be. 
All right, so I got some chicken stock. Now the real trick with a roux, of course, is to add your liquid slowly. So we're gonna go in with, we're aiming to have about a, a total of a cup of chicken stock or so and a cup of milk, um, or you could do a cup of heavy cream, but there I started with about a quarter cup of chicken stock. So I'm gonna incorporate that in. It's really thick right now. I'm gonna add like another quarter cup or so. Uh, I'm also gonna deglaze as I do this, so kinda scrape up the bottom. So this method, you know, adding adding liquid very slowly to a roux, it, it's true no matter what you're doing. So you know, whether, whether you're whether you're making a plain old white sauce like a bechamel, whether you're making a gravy, you always want to add your liquid very slowly, um, especially at the beginning, and get it nicely incorporated before you add any more. And the and the better you do that, the smoother your sauce ends up. You can see how nice and Nice and smooth this is getting. This will be my last chicken stock addition. All right, so I got about a total of a cup of chicken stock in there. You can, of course, also, if you want, you can deglaze this with um, something like wine um, or brandy or any kind of liquor that will add flavor to it and also have a touch of acidity, which goes nicely here. All right, those meatballs are done. Now I'm gonna finish this off with milk. And at this stage, we can add it a little bit more rapidly because our sauce, our butter and flour have already basically been fully incorporated. So add about, add about a cup of milk. Bring that up to a simmer. Uh, I'm gonna actually finish that off with a little bit more nutmeg because I like that flavor. So this dish, um, these meatballs, um, I'm not sure how, what we're gonna eat them with today. My, my daughter asked for pasta, so I'll probably make some pasta to go with them, but traditionally you would have these with um, a cucumber salad, like very cucumbers that are very lightly um, sort of marinated in uh, vinegar. So like sort of like a light pickle almost. Cucumber salad and a, um, uh, could be potato salad, like a vinegary potato salad, um, or, mashed potatoes, um, and then lingonberry jam. Although the closest thing that we would have in the US to lingonberry jam, well, you, you can get lingonberry jam, of course, at the supermarket or at like Ikea, but um, if you wanna make jam out of fresh fruit, it's hard to find lingonberries in the US, so the closest thing we would have would be um, something like uh, cranberry. cranberry, cranberry jam, cranberry jelly. Same stuff you put on your turkey. All right, so I think these meatballs are actually probably pretty much cooked through already. So they're not gonna need to spend too much time in this cream sauce. And there's gonna be plenty of sauce to go on whatever we want, whether it's mashed potatoes or, um, or pasta, which is what we'll probably do because my daughter wanted pasta. So now all we gotta do is let this reduce down until it's just lightly thickened or I guess as thick as you want it. You can make it, you can make thin gravy, you can make it thin, thin gravy, thick gravy. You are after all the commander of the Navy of your pork gravy. <laughs> I don't know, are there other Chef John fans out there? You know, Chef John is actually a neighbor of mine. He lives just, um, we've never met in real life, but we live like within like 10 miles of each other. Um, might, might be fun to do a collaboration sometime. I think we want to finish it off with a little lemon juice. Oh, and you know what else I'm gonna throw in that? In that uh, gravy is touch a touch of soy sauce. A little more umami boost. All right, this looks great to me. We can get our nice beauty shot. I, I can eat one and do that do that mmm thing. These do look good, don't they? If I do say so myself. Get 
some mushrooms on there. That time's for out of there. So here we are. And they do they look like what's in the book? They look pretty similar to what's in the book. Um, of course the flavors are different, but you know, you can get, you can get the recipe in my book. I think that recipe is also on Serious Eats, and if it is, I will link to it. Um, otherwise I'll link to where you can get my book. Um. Hi, Shabu. So there you go. See how nice and tender those meatballs are? That's the trick, you know, like hamburgers, if you cook them all the way through to well done, they get dry, and that's because they're just plain old ground meat. There's nothing holding that. Mm. moisture in whereas meatballs breadcrumbs and eggs and in this case gelatin oh yeah you see how when i push that you see all that juiciness um that's what holds in the juiciness on the uh meatballs all right Chubb. sit sit good girl and a little for you too come on Here you go. Good boy. All right, everyone. Swedish meatballs with mushroom gravy. Um, I will see you later, guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Bye-bye.